a paleontologist on YouTube. Conveniently enough, I'm also the discoverer of the extraordinary Castle Bank fossil deposit. As you might imagine, that's going to feature fairly heavily in this channel, but to start with, here's an introduction to what is surely the biggest paleontological discovery that I'm ever likely to make. Greetings, and welcome to what will be the first of eventually a long playlist on this channel about the Castle Bank biota. I'm going to try to make this accessible to everyone, so if you're a paleontologist, please bear with me on the basic parts, and there will be some juicy new details towards the end. I'm going to go into lots of detail in future videos, but this one is really to set the scene and explain why this deposit is so important. To start with, though, we need to understand a little bit about the fossil record itself. Most of it consists of the remains of a very small proportion of what was alive at the time. Organisms are made of squishy stuff for the most part. Squishy stuff rots away and never gets the immortality it craves. Even a lot of skeletons are made of chitin, which also decays. More slowly, but still fast enough to avoid being fossilised. The only things with a good chance of becoming fossils are very tough materials like biominerals. These minerals include calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate and opal, all of which are essentially rocks before they're even deposited. A lot can happen to them as well, chemical dissolution, mechanical breakage and so on. But such things as shells and bones have a fighting chance. However, only a small fraction of organisms have such a skeleton. Most of the major groups of animals have no hard parts at all, and even when they do have hard parts, we only see the hard parts, we don't see the soft tissues. This can be extremely misleading. So if you look at the video I've got about microconchids and spirorbids, you'll see exactly how you can be led astray by the similarity of a shell. As a result, amazing as the fossil record is overall, it can only tell us about a tiny proportion of life in the past. To understand the full history of life, we're going to need some miracles. Specifically, we're going to need some fossil deposits formed when, by some fluke of chemistry and environmental conditions, somehow soft-bodied animals and all of their details have been preserved. This does happen. It happens surprisingly often, in that sometimes we see uh, that the soft tissues have been replaced or permeated by a mineral that precipitated very rapidly after the animal was buried, something like pyrite or calcium phosphate. In other cases, it seems that something about the conditions actually prevented decay. So instead, we get carbonaceous remains, flattened films quite often, of the animals, other organisms, that were on the seafloor at the time of burying. In either case, the end result is what we call a conservat lagostata, a site of exceptional preservation. And this is where paleontologists start getting excited. There are now hundreds of such sites known from around the world, from all ages and from a wide range of paleoenvironments. They're not all equivalent, though. For example, some preserve only the tough cuticular or chitinous remains. Others, like for example the Maison Creek of Illinois, preserve incredibly soft-bodied animals, but with almost no detail. Others are amazing in terms of detail and soft tissues, but represent a very restricted environment. For example, amber can only capture things that can be found on tree trunks. There is no single holy grail for what we want for fossil preservation, because this is a very diverse world and no one deposit could possibly capture all of the information we might want to know about. However, there are a few things we might look for. It's probably good to have an open marine environment, one that is representative of a wide area of the world, at least within a band of latitude, for example, and one in which the widest range of organisms actually live. It's also an advantage to preserve all of the soft tissues with minimal bias during fossilization, and of course with exceptionally fine detail. That wish list takes us straight to the Burgess Shale, one of the most iconic fossil sites in the world, and rightly so, but also its equivalents in other places. So the Chengjiang biota, Qingjiang, the Majum, the Sirius Passet, Emu Bay, 
Many of these deposits occur around the world at around the same time and are known as the Burgess Shale type faunas. They are preserved in open marine environments, often relatively close to shore, or at least next to an undersea cliff or something like that, and they preserve a wide range of soft-bodied animals in extraordinary detail. There are also a wide range of less good Burgess Jail type faunas where you only get a subset of those, so maybe just the crunchier bits of arthropod, for example. Virtually all of these deposits are from the early and middle Cambrian, when there appears to have been a window of opportunity for these types of fossils to form. We don't entirely understand why, but it may be related to the seawater chemistry at the time, and possibly also to the lack of deep burrowing, because that hadn't really yet evolved amongst animals. As a result, though, we know a lot about life in the Cambrian seas. Unfortunately, we know quite a lot less about life in the Ordovician seas, which was an equally critical time in the history of animal life. This brings us, finally, to Castlebank. It was found here in the middle of Wales, just a few miles from my house, and it's a Burgess Shale-type fauna in terms of the preservation and its open marine environment, but it's from the middle of the Ordovician. It has micrometer scale details, entirely soft-bodied animals, and internal organs. It has major groups of animals that have no other fossil record at all. It's a sort of place that you stumble across, then start rubbing your eyes and checking whether you're awake. The first papers were published in 2022 and 2023, which gave me a slightly surreal few moments of fame. You can find other videos about Castlebank here on YouTube, including a long podcast by the wonderful Paleocast team. Um, check the description for details. I should say at this point that it's very much a team effort. I work on a daily basis with my wife and partner in crime, uh, Lucy Muir, who... Um, oh, speak of the devil. Say hello. Hello. Yeah, that'll do. Anything else you want to say? Uh, you should all watch Joe's videos because they're really, really good. Oh, and so like them and subscribe. My humble apologies. Normal service will be resumed shortly. Um, but we also have a wonderful team of collaborators and in a variety of countries and we bring them in for particular papers for their specialist knowledge and understanding on, and skills and working on particular groups. So more papers have been published since those first ones and there are several more in the pipeline going through the process at the moment and there are plenty more that we started work on. So it's just it's a slow process. What many people don't realise is how long it takes to publish papers, especially if you're not employed to do it. Studying the material, imaging, writing takes a good long while, but then you have the whole peer review process, which can add months or even years to the publication time. In many cases, we really need a second specimen to confirm details before the species can be properly described and formally named. There is, therefore, a huge amount of material that is sitting in our house, waiting to be bitten up. This is a spare room, currently taken over by worms and arthropods and Lucy's loom. The rest of it is mostly upstairs. But what are the fossils themselves? I'll make videos about each paper as we publish on this deposit, um, as a user-friendly introduction, but I want to give you a flavour of it here. One of the peculiarities of the Castle Bank fauna is that most of the fossils are surprisingly small. For someone as short-sighted as me, that means about one to three millimetres long. Um, not all of them, some of the sponges get up to a few centimetres, for example. But generally, they are smaller than most people are comfortable finding. However, they are of comparable size to a lot of the modern representatives of the same groups, the little worms and arthropods. These groups are dominated by very small animals. So the question really is whether these are unusually small, or whether it's just that the ones in the Cambrian that we're more used to seeing are unusually large. Despite the small size, though, the fossils from Castlebank are incredibly detailed. When we first started the Castlebank project, we ended up crowdfunding for microscopes, and thanks to the extraordinary generosity of many people, ended up buying some extremely nice equipment, as in research-grade photomicroscopy kit. I'll do a video on all that at some point. Even at the highest magnifications, though, it's clear that there's more detail there than we can properly observe. For example, this is a little arthropod that we illustrated in the 2023 paper, which is just over one millimetre long, 
but has the gut preserved, as well as these big spiky appendages. Nonetheless, at the maximum level of resolution that we can get, there are definitely hints that there is yet more there to tease out. We've recently found, however, that we are able to use electron microscopes on these, these fossils, which is something we didn't think would be possible because the carbon is so thin. However, using very low power, we started to get good results, including on this little arthropod. So, the detail in this animal has suddenly ratcheted up another notch or two. We're now starting to write it up, and it's beginning to make a lot more sense. The details that we can see in these now are getting on for a similar level to what you can get out of modern material. Obviously, we don't have complete detail. We don't have a lot of the information on the, the soft tissue anatomy, the internal organs, and so on. But the, the size of the structures we're having to go to electron microscope level to be able to describe what is there. And that's really quite an extraordinary thing. It's not what you expect in fossils. We're still working on the details of how this fossilization process happened, but we now have uh, at least the, the backbone of a working hypothesis, and it seems to involve sulfuric acid. They're gradually building up more bits of evidence pointing in that direction, but it's starting to become a consistent story. In terms of the range of fossil groups that we have at Castlebank, the um, number is still going up. We're still getting one or two new species a day on fieldwork, and the total diversity is rapidly appro approaching an approximation to everything. We now have, we think, over 20 phyla, uh, which is about half of the major groups of animals known from modern or fossil records. When the first press releases came out, I think a lot of people were fairly sceptical. Justifiably so, but sceptical. The fossils were tiny, and they take some serious work to really understand them and tease out whatever information is in them. And worse than that, we could only put in a tiny proportion of what we had even then, because it just takes up so much space on the pages to be able to justify the interpretations. The cynics might have been expecting us to be overstating what we had and making overly grandiose claims, but we knew all along that we had far more than we were actually claiming, that there's much more there yet to come out. And we knew that we'd be able to back this up in future papers, which has started to happen, but there's still a long, long way to go yet. So we've been making some bold claims about how important this site is, but we stand by them. And and on this channel, I'll be able to uh, share some of that with you in due course. I say some of that because we have to be careful about what we actually put out in the public domain. The highest impact discoveries we can't show here because that then causes problems for publication in high impact journals and press releases and so on down the line. But there's still a lot that we can share with you that I can be, I'll be able to show you bits and pieces of undescribed material as we go along. Of course, I can also talk a lot more about the ecology, the background of the site, the sedimentology and environment, um, the process of how we go about finding these things, and lots of specific fossils, as well as anything that's actually been published, because then I can produce a video as a sort of documentary. There will therefore be a lot more videos coming on Castlebank, but what would you like to see? Let me know in the comments and uh, what you're particularly interested in, what you'd really like to find out about, and I'll see if I can help. This channel is not just about Castle Bank, though. In fact, it can't be, because no fossil deposit can be understood on its own. If you want to really get to grips with any site like this, you have to understand not just the rest of the surrounding fossil record, but also modern life. So I'm going to be covering lots of different aspects of life, both ancient and modern. My main interests are in the invertebrates, the smaller things that are most of biodiversity, and have been for half a billion years. I'll be trying to tie together the ancient and modern worlds, looking for parallels and just trying to understand them. I hope that sounds appealing, and if it does, please do subscribe or you'll be in trouble with Lucy. And also click that little like button under the video if, if you feel that way inclined. So I look forward to reading your thoughts and indeed to seeing you next time.